Good morning. And again, here we are. It's November. Can you believe that? It's November 2021. Amazing how time goes. And this is the time of the year, the season, to for every reason it is to be thankful. And I love November and December and all times of the year, but specifically during the month of November, a time for us to uh, reset and think about how blessed we really are in the eyes of the living God that we're serving. I don't know where you are or what you're going through this morning, but I pray that you would join us in this service. And as we enter into his gates with thanksgiving in our hearts, I pray that your heart will be ready to receive what God has for you this morning. I believe that there's miracles and exports that's ready to take place. So join us this morning, New Hope Community Church. Also, you can be able to later on watch us on YouTube. God bless you, and we'll see you soon. Amen. On the Gospel of John, chapter 5, we're going to dismiss the children, if there are any. I think the little grandbaby there. Uh, chapter 5, starting out with verse 1. And you're probably all familiar with this patches of Scripture. Scripture. In chapter 5, starting over verse 1, after this, there was a feast of Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called the Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these, uh, in these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stirred it, uh, stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Boy, what a way to be healed, huh? What a way to be healed. Whoever stepped in the water when the angel came first, they were the ones who got healed. I don't know about you, but... I'm thinking, and I, I preached this passage of scripture before, but I don't know about you, but my feet would be right there in that pool almost 24-7 until that angel came, if that was the case. But here he was. Let's continue to read the passage of the scripture. And so uh, it, then it says that whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now, a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? That's the question, right? Do you want to, you, you've been here for 38 years. Do you want to be made well? Uh, I don't, it, it, even if I was, for 38 years, I would have asked somebody, hey, can you get me over there in that pool? And can I get somebody to, Come and watch me every eight hours and just throw me in the pool when you see it stirring up so I can be healed. Uh, something. Because, you know, sometimes there are things that's right in front of our face and we don't even see it. Did you know that? Some things that we have and we don't even see it. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath and Jews and the Jews uh, therefore said to him who was cured, is this the Sabbath? It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, he who made me well and said to me, take up my bed and walk. Then they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who he was. For Jesus had withdrawn himself and a mother too being in that same place. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made well, sin no more, at least the worst thing come upon you. And the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Father, we ask that you would bless your word, that you would keep your hands upon us and Lord, give us listening ears and attentive hearts to receive what you have for us today, these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I look at this portion of the scripture, and I wonder, 38 years, 38 years. You know, sometimes we carry junk around that long all our lives. We take it from the womb to the tomb. And sometimes we have to discover that there needs to be some changes made in our life. And this is a fine example of an individual 
who has been sick for 38 years and probably had more than one opportunity to be healed. But Jesus came along and asked him the question, do you want to be healed? Now, there are choices that we all make, and I realize that, uh, but I also look at it this way right here. The lenses of God's eyes are totally different than the lenses of yours and mine. And we need to see what Jesus sees sometimes in us because we see ourselves and others quite differently than the Lord sees us. If he made us, then he made us perfectly good in his eyes. Imagine that. He said that we, you and I, that know Jesus, that we are a chosen generation. That you are a raw priesthood. That you are a holy nation. That you are a peculiar or different or unusual people. That you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now if you think about this, first of all, this passage of the scripture is the only time and the only gospel that is utilized as a parable in the gospels. It's in the book of John chapter 5. It is the only time that they exert this portion of the scripture because it's a fine example that when we see the lenses of God's eyes as us, God viewing us and how much he thinks about us and how much he loves us, then you will be and see your value. You know what the, the biggest problem I think with Christians and, and is the fact that we don't see our value. We don't see our value. Folks, let me tell you something. You can see your value and still be in the spirit of God without being arrogant or egotistic. All you got to do is see your value and see your worth and see what God has placed inside of you and your worth. I am worth something to Jesus. The devil has told you and I a bunch of lies time and time again because you have failed in one area that you are no good. And I want you to say, I rebuke that thing in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I rebuke it because God will always encourage us as his people to choose wisely that because he wants us to have his best. But yet he still is going to make us to have our own choices to choose in the end. The end result is still our choice. But he really wants you to choose the best. How do you choose the best? Well, number one. You got to be in the word of God. You got to study this thing to show yourself a proven to God. A woman that need not be ashamed. You got to walk in the spirit of God. And some of us don't always do that. Most of us don't do it all the time. But when we walk in the spirit of God, study his word, and, and in his presence, we began to connect directly with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus and understand what is the best choices for us. Because God wants us to take the right path of our life. You know that when you are taking a bad path. We, we know that, don't you? Listen, you don't eat foods that does not go well with your stomach or that you may be allergic to. You don't eat that because... It could get you sick. You know, there's certain foods that I can't eat because I would get sick. I would get gravely ill. And I know that because I've had a reaction to some of those foods. It's not many because I can pretty much eat anything any time of the day. My kids always said I have an ironclad stomach that I can eat just about anything. But there's a few things that I can't eat. So the same applies to us in the word of God, we have to know the right choices that we make. The scripture says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. And I say this repeatedly because I want you to understand that when we are aligned with the thoughts and the mind of Jesus and make the right choices, things began to happen. I understand that sometimes we need help from other people. How many of you know that? You are never going to get through this world without some help from some people. And so, but on the other hand, you cannot help yourself to achieve what you need to achieve without others 
and others may need you as well. So, but others cannot help you achieve to your highest potential without you helping yourself. You have to learn how to help yourself. And the only way that you're going to get to know how to help yourself is really healthy people don't minimize their problems. So when we don't minimize our problems, we begin to accept them and try to seek help and do something about it. We know, you and I should know the stuff that's inside of us that is not a good choice, that is mess, that needs to be at rest. You, anybody here with me this morning? You know that there's some stuff that's inside of you that it needs to be gotten away from. Wounds sometimes go unhealed. And when they go unhealed, they give us a false illusion of us as people. I believe that this is what happens to this guy at the pool. He had a false illusion of what's going to turn out for him. Because 38 years, he probably said, you know what, this ain't happening. I've been here for 38 years. Who knows how old the man was? Let's say if he was 25 and been sitting there at that well for 38 years. You do the math. He's almost 60 years old or more. So now he's an older man and he feels that, hey, you know what? I'm just here. If it happens, it happens. No, we still, as long as we got breath in our nostrils and are willing and able, God will continue to work with us and through us and for us. But it's going to still be yours and my decision. You cannot do this without the help of God and other people as well. But you first got to acknowledge what you need to work on. Did you know that you can go around and deny your junk for life? I've seen people who got all types of addictions and they'll say, well, you know what? It's, it's just something that I can get over. I, I can stop if I want to. I said, really? Okay. Do you want to? Here's the question I always ask people when they got junk in their life. How bad do you want to get rid of it? That's the first question. How bad do you want to get rid of it? Well, I really want to get rid of it. Okay. And so then the next question I always ask, how much of it do you want to keep? And, and that's the question. How much of it do you want to keep? And I said, do you want to keep 10%, 20%, 30%? Nine times out of 10 when I ask that question, you know what the answer I get? Well, I like to keep about 30% and get rid of about 70%. I said, then you'll never get rid of it until you want to just give all of it away. You see, you can't come to Jesus with 10, 20, 30% of you. You got to come to Jesus with all of you. That's just the way it is. You know, you can't come to him and say, Lord, I want to give you a part of me, but I can't give you all of me. You see, the scripture says that Jesus is a jealous God. Yes. You see, he's not going to tolerate with just part of you. If he went to the cross for yours and my sins, how much should he have your heart and your soul? Yes. He wants all of it. And all he wants is the best to give back to you and me. Now, I mean, what kind of father would do that? Say, look, all I want to know is that you love me so much. That you love me so much that the world won't mean anything to you. Scripture says that whosoever is a friend of this world is an enemy of God. Whosoever is a friend of this world is an enemy of God. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be an enemy of God. That doesn't make me perfect because I'm not a friend of the world. You see, we are in this world, but we are not of this world by what we do through our behavior and the choices that you and I make. You see, that's why the scripture says, your word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. We cannot sin against God when we have the word of God embedded in our heart and our soul. And then when we do make mistakes, because we will, for there is none righteous, no, not one, for all have stumbled and fallen short of the glory of God. Our responsibility is to get back up and say, get thee behind me, Satan. I got to get with the brethren and sisters in Christ Jesus and do the right thing. I got to get back into the word of God. Because I'm going to tell you, the word of God will keep you. But not only will it keep you, you must apply it to your life. You must apply. See, we can read this. We can study this thing to show ourselves a proven to God, a woman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Listen, we can do that. However, we must make it applicable to our lives by applying it to our life. You can't get married and then say, uh, I'm going to be single, but I'm going to be married. That ain't going to work long. 
Uh, your spouse ain't going to put up with that. You got to be one or the other. You're going to be married as one or you're going to just be a single person and, and do whatever you need to do. But if you're going to get married, you got to be one. That's the way Jesus is. When you come to him, he says he's a jealous God. I will share my glory with no man. So, and you are part of his glory because you are part of his creation. Yes. And if he's a part of your creation, I don't know, no parent would say that that's not my child. I never, ne I never met a parent would say, that's not my child. No, but it is. And they are proud of the fact that that's their child. That's what Jesus is to us. He is our father. We can come boldly before his throne that we may obtain his mercy and find grace in the time of need. Let me just read something to you a moment here. There was a story that was told of an orphan boy who was living with his grandmother when their house caught a fire. The grandmother tried to get upstairs to save the little boy's life. In essence, she lost her own life. The boy began to cry frantically. The flames was going up. He heard, and there's a man that was down below, heard the little boy's cry. And as the little boy cried, this man began to crawl himself up a, a pipe to like the third or fourth story to get this little boy. The little boy see him. And later on, several weeks, this little boy grabs hold of his neck as they're going back down and just choking this man as he's coming down the pipe. Several weeks later, there's a public hearing to determine who was going to receive this little boy's custody. He was just a child. It was a farmer, a teacher, and one of the wealthiest men in town who was putting their name out there to take custody of this little child. And they all made their petitions. And as they talked, the young boy's eyes fell to the floor. Then a stranger walked into the room. And as he walked into the room, he had his hands in his pocket. And the crowd grasped because they were shocked because the man showed his hands. Because when the man was bringing the little boy down the pipe, the pipe was sizzling hot. And the little boy was choking him, holding on for dear life. And as he was bringing this little boy down the pipe, it singed his hands and scarred them. And so the stranger walks in the room, shows the scars of his hand, the crowd gasped, the boy cried out in recognition. There was a man who had saved his life and whose hands had been burnt to a crisp when he climbed up the hot pipe. And with a leap, the boy threw his arms around the man's neck and held on for dear life. And he said out loud, this is the man who saved my life. The other men, the teacher, the farmer, and the richest man in town silently walked out of the room, leaving the boy and the rescuer of the little boy alone. Those marred hands had settled the issue of who would take this boy home and raise him. My friend, I'm going to tell you something. When I first read that story, I wept because I know that's how much Jesus loves you and me. That he died on the cross for you and me. Can you imagine somebody climbing up a pipe, sizzling on, to save this little boy's life and probably would never be able to use his hands again? That's the love of Jesus for yours and my life. Sometimes we have things right in front of our face and we don't even know it. Sometimes we have people that love us so dearly and we have taken advantage of it. And one day they will be gone. Sometimes there are 
so many opportunities and privileges for us that we take it for granted that it's no big deal. But the scripture says in 1 Psalms 139 verse 14, I give thanks to the Lord because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God makes no mistakes when he made you and called you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. So sometimes you have to say to yourself, not in an arrogant way, not in an egotistic way, not in a prideful way. You just have to say, because I'm worth it. Hallelujah. Because I'm worth it. I do this because I'm worth it. Because the devil will always tell you, you are not. And I want you to know this morning, you are worth it because God really loves us. And we are special to him. It is important to understand that God is not your enemy. We must realize that some people around us have not modeled sometimes the kind of love that God gives us. Which in turn has impaired of our truly understanding who God is. And sometimes we get confused with that. I want you to know, I was brought up in the school of hard knocks. My parents, they did the best they could. I loved them. But that's a, that's a lot of wrong things they did, like most parents. It's a lot of wrong things we do. But if we can go back and reciprocate that and say, hey, listen, there's some things that I need to make right, that's great. But the most important thing is to understand how we were wounded by those mistakes and how we can start processing our healing. You see, let me, let me, let me just share this with you. I was brought, brought up in an era of time when there was the civil rights movement. I supposed to have been a racist. Now you may say, a black man a racist? I'm going to tell you something, folks. There's racism that comes in every ethnicity of people based on your prejudices. But you know, I had a choice to either live with bitterness, hatred, defiance, based on what I had endured in life, or I could have made a decision, which I did, to leave that jump behind and let God do the work in my life and heal me. You see, you have a choice. I have a choice to hate or to be bitter or to be angry or to be resentful or defiant or to say, you know what? I'm not going to get through life with that because I'm going to tell you, Every ethnic group in, you can think of in this world has helped me. Has helped me. And you know something? Whether it's black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Indian, Samoans, Tongans, you, you name it across the board. I have met them and they have helped me. So you know what? They took out all prejudices from me. Now, I know we all say little jokes about different people and stuff like that, but I don't hold no hostages as far as bitterness. And hey, you know why? Because I made a choice to love people for who they are until they show me who they are. You have to make a choice. This man at the well made a choice when Jesus came. It took him 38 years. Folks, it don't take you 38 years. It don't take you 38 years to make a good choice for your life. You follow what I'm saying? I want you to understand the significance of that because when we do, life changes. And folks, life is gone that quick. What you live and how you live is your legacy that you leave. I want to leave a good legacy that if God is for me, who can be against me? He called me for a will, a purpose, and a plan. You are special in the eyes of God. And folks, let me just say this. You are worth it. 
you know, I love people who have worked all their lives and they got something to show for it. You know what I say to them? Who raved for you? Who raved for you? Praise God. I, I, I went to a, a ball the other night with my brother. It was called the Marine Ball. Once a year they go. And I, I always wanted to go, but they never had it in the city of San Francisco. But they had it this, this time. And he had bought tickets months in advance. And it was so eloquently done and so nice. But they were there to celebrate the Marines from the youngest Marine that had, that had just been enlisted to the oldest Marine who was still living. He was in in 1947. And they celebrated these people. Let me tell you something, folks. God is a celebratory God. Did you know that? He went to the wedding. He wants us to celebrate, but he wants us to do it with praise and adoration unto him. Don't you ever forget where you came from. Don't you ever forget who you are. Don't you ever forget where you're going. Because if you go there and you got there, just remember you didn't get there by yourself. Amen? Amen. Praise God. I sure am thankful that you have been a part of the service this morning. And I pray the blessings of God has blessed you thus far. And I'm asking that you will be touched by, your, by God's presence and let the Holy Spirit just continue to do a work of God in your life. Whatever you have been blessed with this morning, may you share it not only in your heart, but share it with others that they too may be excited of the spirit of the living God. Remember this, it's not by might nor by power, but by his spirit, say the Lord God Almighty. So I pray wherever you are this morning or listening to this message, I ask the spirit of the living God will continue to move in your life. God bless you and thank you for being a part of us this service here at New Hope Community Church. Amen. We'll talk to you soon.
Thank you.